I'd like to thank Brother Matthew for reading our scriptural text on this morning, which came from the book of 2 Corinthians, chapter was 10, and the verses were 1 through 6, and it is from that passage of scripture that I would like to draw upon the backboards of your minds and preach from the subject, ain't too proud to beg, ain't too proud to beg. In 1966, the baddest group to ever sing vocals, The Temptations, came out with a song that peaked at number 13 on the Billboard pop charts and number one on the Billboard R&B charts for eight non-consecutive weeks. The song was entitled, Ain't Too Proud to Beg. David Ruffin was the lead vocalist on this song. The song would go, I know you want to leave me, but I refuse to let you go. If I have to beg and plead for your sympathy, I don't mind because you mean that much to me. Ain't too proud to beg, sweet darling. Please don't leave me, girl, don't you go. Ain't too proud to plead, baby, baby. Please don't leave me, girl, don't you go. That was the first verse of the song. That song had four verses, and if you didn't know the song or if you don't know who the Temptations is, congratulations, you're more saved than the rest of us. <laughs> but to those of us that used to be lost, that used to go to a juke joint every now and then, to those that listen to something other than Christian radio, we know who the Temptations are. We know about that song, and it would be easy to preach a sermon from the four verses in this song, it would be to even just from the first verse of this song and make strong biblical applications without even attempting to stretch the scriptures. Because if we just replace David Ruffin with Jesus, we can see Jesus and God saying these same exact words to each and every one of us. We see, I know you want to leave me. When he speaks, he speaks from the platform of being omniscient, meaning that he is all-knowing. He knows why we came to him in the first place. But he also knows why one would want to leave him. We see in the parable of Matthew chapter 13, verses 1 through 9, the parable of the sower, that we learn that some would never come to Christ. And the reason why they'll never come to Christ is because they have a hard heart. However, some will leave Jesus because they were never really rooted and grounded in the word of Almighty God. But believe it or not, some would even leave Christ because they think that the world has more to offer. So whether we want to stay or whether we want to go, Jesus knows exactly why we want to do such. But to those that want to leave, the song goes, but I refuse to let you go. Isn't it good to know that we serve a God that's not going to let us walk away from him without a fight? Don't you know that Christ takes his mission of saving souls seriously? Once Jesus has us, we need to recognize on this morning that Jesus is fully committed to keeping us and guarding us. This is what he said to in his prayer to the Father in John chapter 17, verse 12. He says, Father, everyone you have ever given to me, I have kept them, I have guarded them, and I have lost none save the son of perdition that the scriptures may be fulfilled. We need to have the same mindset in regards to humanity that Jesus has. Charles Spurgeon once said, if sinners will be damned, at least let them leap to hell over our bodies. And if they will perish, then let them perish with our arms around their knees imploring them to stay. And if hell must be filled, at least let it be filled in the teeth of our exertions and let not one 
go down there unwarned and unprayed for. As we continue on in the song, we see that if I have to beg and plead for your sympathy, don't you know that this is exactly, this is exactly what Jesus did as he stood in glory. He looked down upon his creation and he saw our plight. He saw that we were destined for doom. So what did he do? He didn't stay up. He decided to stoop down to earth that he might save us by his grace. His very presence showed the severity of our situation and the sincerity of his love for each and every one of us. And we see that in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 through 5. And then the song goes, I don't mind because you mean that much to me. I believe it was the Apostle John that wrote in 1 John chapter 4, verses 9 through 10. 1 John chapter 4, verses 9 through 10, where the Bible reads, In this the love of God was made manifest among us that God sent his only son into the world so that we might live through him. In this is love. Not that we have loved God, but that God loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. And then the verse, the, the course comes in by saying, ain't too proud to beg. Jesus was not too proud to beg. Jesus humbled himself, which is a form of begging and coming down, humbling yourself, getting in the position to let someone know how serious you want them. Jesus humbled himself by wrapping himself in humanity and was obedient to death just so you and I can live. And we see that in Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 through 8. The entire life of our Savior was an appeal. But to the appeal that the apostle scriptural text, gospel preaching is an appeal. Edification is an appeal. Instructive discipline is an appeal. It is an earnest entreaty to get right with God. Our scriptural text on this morning provides such an appeal. A meek, gentle, humble, yet bold appeal. An appeal Paul has made to the church during his day, and his words are as authoritative and potent today as we ask, beg, beseech, implore, plead, and urge humanity to get right with God. And we ain't too proud to do it. In the Pauline epistles, the apostle Paul pleaded with the brethren then, and through this same verse, he pleads with us today not only through this verse, but through most of his epistles in which he gives a plea. And wisdom demands that we take heed if we intend on making heaven our home when Jesus comes again. So we as Christians, just like Paul, we can't be too proud to plead. And what I want to do is I want us to look through the epistles of Paul. And I want to see where five times the apostle Paul <laughs> pleaded with the brethren to get right with God, to make things right, to make different decisions. And when you see how often Paul pleads with these Christians, you would think that these Christians were vampires. You would think that they're vampires because do you know why vampires make so many mistakes? Because they have no self-reflection. And see, we should have self-reflection. We should be able to look in the mirror of God's word 
And we should be able to see ourselves for who we are and make different decisions and better decisions that when we are told to get right, that we will actually get right. But yet we see that people are as hard-headed in the 21st century as they were in the first century to the extent that somebody has to get up week after week, day after day, letter after letter, pleading with people that have made a commitment to God to do better, be better, get right, because Jesus is coming soon. And so the first thing that we see in this pleading is found in Romans chapter 12, verse 1. In Romans chapter 12, verse 1, we see where Paul pleads. He says, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. I want us to look at the word plead today. The word plead means to implore, to beseech, to beg, as we are talking about today, to make an appeal. And the P in plead is for present. Present yourself as a living sacrifice. Paul is begging the Christians in Rome to present themselves as a living sacrifice. I appeal to you, therefore, brethren, and beg of you, in view of all the mercies of God to make a decisive dedication of your bodies. In other words, Paul is saying, I want you to start presenting all of your members and faculties as a living sacrifice, holy, which means devoted and consecrated and well-pleasing to God, which is your reasonable which means that it makes sense, it is rational, it is an intelligent service that you offer to God. It is your spiritual worship. As we look throughout the first 11 chapters of the book of Romans, we see that the depth of God's riches, uh, uh, the depth of the riches of the divine mercy has already been laid down by the apostle. He explained it very well, and now his argument has come to an end. He ends his argument with chapter 12. Paul speaks about the mercy that has been given to Jewish Christians, the mercy that has been given to Gentile Christians, and the mercy in prospect for all of Israel. And now we've come to the point where Paul is done with that argument. He's now giving the conclusion that as a result of this information, hence chapter 12. God's plan has been explained and the apostle appeals to those of us that have found mercy in God. God not giving us what we do deserve. And in the name of that mercy, we have one job to continue in the goodness of God. And how do we continue in the goodness of God? We continue in the goodness of God by doing what Romans chapter 12 verse 1 says by presenting our bodies as a living sacrifice the Mosaic dispensation with its sacrifices has ended it closed when Christ our Passover was, was offered for us nevertheless a new order of sacrifice has come in that sacrifice is that we don't have to give a goat. We don't have to give a ram. We don't have to give a sheep. We just need to give ourselves. You know, as the victim on the altar was surrendered wholly to God, so our bodies with all their members should be consecrated to God's service, not as slain, but as living sacrifices. And we do this when we recognize that we ourselves, that God gave us a body, and that body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. And we read about that in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 19. And we do this when we are used to serve God. The consecration of our body to God is not an outward act. It's not about hygiene. It's not about washing. It's not about the removing of dirt. 
but rather like the sacrifice on the altar, it is an act of the mind. It is an act of reason. Hence, the apostle uses the term our reasonable service. You use your mind, you use your head, you thought about that, and you respond to God with your heart, your inner man, and you allow your inner man to dictate to your outer man how it will respond in this crooked and broken world. So here is what we are called to do. With God helping us, let us take our everyday ordinary life and place it before God as an offering. Embracing what God does for us is the best thing that we can actually do for him. So yes, he begs us to present ourselves as a living sacrifice, but he begs us to do something else in the book of Romans. We see in Romans chapter 15, verse 30. Romans chapter 15 and the verses 30, the apostle Paul writes, I appeal to you, brothers, by our Lord Jesus Christ and by the love of the Spirit to strive together with me in your prayers to God on my behalf. Not present ourselves as a living sacrifice, but we are being embedded to labor together in prayer. That's the L in plea. We need to labor together in prayer. We need to strive together in prayer. There are so many people that say, well, I know how to pray. Why well, I got to come together to pray? Because the book begs us to strive together, to labor together in prayer. In other words, Paul says, I appeal to you. I entreat you, brethren, for the sake of our Lord Jesus Christ and by the love given by the Spirit to unite with me in earnest wrestling and prayer to God on my behalf. This urgent request of the apostle for his brethren's prayers show on the part of the apostle Paul his strong confidence in their faith and devotion. See, one of the things I try to tell young people that's looking for a spouse is that the first qualification you should ask of the person that you're looking to enter into a relationship with is, can that person pray for you? Can that person pray for you? And the reason being is because we know God doesn't hear the prayers of a sinner. We know that those outside the covenant have no relationship with God. So I want to make sure that if I'm going to spend my life with somebody, I'm going to spend my life with somebody that's going to know me better than anybody else and that if I get to a point in which I cannot pray for myself, I'm glad I am yoked and married to someone who can pray for me, for somebody that can get a prayer through. And so for Paul to act, he is an apostle. God speaks directly to him, and he goes to these brethren that are not as spiritually gifted as those. They are more sound and upright. He says, please, labor with me. Strive me. Pray to God for me. This is what he asks. The Bible tells us in James chapter 5, verse 16. James chapter 5, verse 16. The prayer of a righteous person has great power as it is working. Now, if one righteous person can pray and get something done, what about righteous people? What about a righteous group? What about a righteous neighborhood? What about a righteous community? What about a righteous county? What about a righteous church? What about a righteous city? What about a righteous area code? What about a righteous zip code? What about a righteous state? What about a righteous nation? What about a righteous continent? What about a righteous hemisphere? What about a righteous world? What can be accomplished if everybody speak with one voice and say, God is our father and we need you now. And so until we get there, we just going to have to settle with the pleading and say, brethren, pray for me. Brethren, pray for us. But he is begging them to do this not just for him, but with him. 
Don't we know that people are moved? The word of God goes forth and boldness continues when we labor together in prayer. That's what we see in Acts chapter 4, verse 31. Or how about the story that we read about in Acts 12? In Acts chapter 12, Towards the church praying together for Peter while he was in prison. And so as the story goes, the prayers went up, the Holy Spirit interceded, according to Romans chapter 8, verse 26 and 27. Jesus delivered it, according to John chapter 14, verse 14. The Father heard it, according to John chapter 9, verse 31, and sent an angel to deliver the apostle from prison, according to Psalm 91, verse 11. And I stopped by this morning just to let you know that nothing has changed. Prayer is still the means by which we talk to God. We still have brethren we can pray for and pray with. The Holy Spirit is still here. Jesus is still alive. God is still on the throne. And there are angels presently serving the Almighty and watching over each and every one of us. Therefore, I have one request, my brothers and sisters. Let us pray for one another. Pray strenuously with and for one another to God the Father through the power of our Master Jesus Christ, through the love of the Holy Spirit. Not only must we present ourselves as living sacrifices and labor together in prayer, but we see Paul making another appeal in the following chapter. In Romans chapter 16, verse 7. In Romans chapter 16, verse 7, the Bible reads, appeal to, others to watch out for those who cause divisions and create obstacles contrary to the doctrine of that you have been taught, avoid them. What the apostle begged the church there to do, and what he begs us to do today, is that we need to eyeball those who cause division. We need to eyeball those that cause division. We need to put our eyes on them. We need to look out. We need to watch. We need to guard against. We need to watch out. We need to mark those who cause division. The Apostle Paul says, I appeal to you, brethren, to be on your guard concerning those who create dissensions and difficulties and cause division in opposition to the doctrine. That means to the teaching which we have been taught. He warns us to turn aside from them, to avoid them. We need to understand on this morning, my brothers and sisters, that false teaching attacks the heart and core of the Christian faith. No matter how pious or devout an individual may be, they cannot be pleasing to the Lord while teaching or following false teaching. What poison is to the physical body False doctrine is to the soul. We should not be amazed when false teaching arises. There are warnings and predictions throughout the entire New Testament. Jesus tells us that false teachers would come as wolves in sheep's clothing. How do we know that a sheep is a wolf? Because sheep don't eat other sheep. When you see some, a sheep devouring somebody else within the body of Christ, that's no sheep. That's a wolf in sheep's clothing. Jesus says they're going to come. Wolves in sheep's clothing are false teachers, and they will deceive many, according to Matthew chapter 7, verse 15, and Matthew chapter 24, verse 4 and 5. Did not Paul warn the Ephesian elders of such in Acts chapter 20? Verse 29 and 30, did not Paul warn us that Satan has ministers pretending to be ministers of righteousness? In 2 Corinthians chapter 11, 
verses 13 through 15, the Bible tells us that some will depart from the faith because they have given heed to seducing spirits and the teachings of the devil. According to 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1, 2, and 3, the Bible goes on to tell us that men would rather hear fables than truth, and thus they will turn to the fable. And we read about that in 2 Corinthians 4, verses 1 through 4. Such individuals, the Apostle Peter tells us, when damnable heresies, according to 2 Peter chapter 1, 2 Peter chapter 2, and the verse is 1. And brethren, we need to understand on this morning that we as a local congregation are not immune to this. Are we checking behind every person who presents God's word in this place? Are we checking ourselves with the scriptures whenever there is a disagreement with brethren or some discomfort with our conscience? Are we checking individuals who desire to place membership here? Are we vigilant to the deceptive workings of some within our number who could be planning a public departure from the faith and destructive split from this congregation through private teachings and midnight meetings? The Bible is right, my brothers and sisters, for certain people have crept in unnoticed who long ago were designated for this condemnation. Ungodly people, Jude 4 tells us, who pervert the grace of our God into sensuality and deny our only master and Lord, Jesus Christ. So one final word of counsel, my friends. Keep a sharp eye out for those who take bits and pieces of the teaching that we have learned and use them to make trouble. Give these people a wide berth. They have no intention of living for our master, Jesus. They're only in this for what they can get out of it and aren't above using pious sweet talk to dupe unsuspecting innocent people. And so this is why the apostle is pleading. He pleaded with them then because of these problems. He pleaded with us today. Now let's deal with the A and plead. The A and plead is found in 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verses 10. A very familiar passage of scripture. 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verses 10 Hear the words of the apostle. He says, I appeal to you, brothers, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you agree and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be united in the same mind and the same judgment. The A in plea is that the apostle pleads with us to accept no division. Yes, we have to eyeball those that cause division. And even when someone is determined to make sure division happens, we need to no longer accept division. Accept no division. Paul says, but I urge and entreat you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you be in perfect harmony and full agreement in what you say. And that there be no dissensions or factions or divisions among you, but that you be perfectly united in your common understanding and in your thoughts and in your judgments. How earnest, my brothers and sisters, and imploring is the apostles' exhortation that we should maintain unity. We ought to have no distinctive party declarations among us. The mere existence of denominationalism already violates this plea. May we not contribute by having schisms among us. Division is not only contrary to this plea in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 10, but is contrary to Christ's prayer in John chapter 17, verse 20 through 23, as well as the unity of the Spirit that we read about in Ephesians chapter 4, verses 1 through 6. 
Don't you know that division represents carnality, not spirituality? According to 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 1 through 5. Division, according to the Apostle Paul in Galatians chapter 5, verses 19 through 21, is a work of the flesh. It is not a fruit of the Spirit. And those who practice such division or accept division shall not inherit the kingdom of God. For these reasons, we must plead with Paul to all men to seek the unity found in Christ and his church and not the division of the devil in his dominion. This is a serious concern that must be brought up. We must get along with each other. We must learn to be considerate of one another, cultivating a life in common. I want to close this morning by giving our fifth and final point, which is found in Philemon, verses 8 through 10. Philemon, verses 8 through 10. In Philemon, verses 8 through 10, there's only one chapter, so Philemon, verses 8 through 10. <laughs> the Bible reads, Accordingly, though I am bold enough in Christ to command you to do what is required, yet for love's sake, I prefer to appeal to you. I, Paul, an old man, and now a prisoner also for Christ Jesus, I appeal to you for my child, Onesimus, whose father I became in my imprisonment. The D in plead is that we must dignify one another. We have to respect one another. We have to love one another, no matter what our position may be, no matter how someone has hurt us, no matter what someone may have said about you, no matter what the situation or the circumstance may be, we as Christians must dignify one another. Paul is begging one man who is a child of God to receive another man that he has a situation and a, and a, and a grudge against who has also obeyed the gospel to forgive and be reconciled, to get along, to fix this thing that has separated you. See, Onesimus worked for Philemon, and Philemon was a Christian. Onesimus was not. And Onesimus ran off and escaped without fulfilling his debt to Philemon. This is why Paul said, whatever Onesimus owes you, charge it to my account. In verse 18, Onesimus made his way to Rome while he is escaping from Philemon. And there was a man in Rome who was in prison. His name was Paul, who is the author of this letter. Some way and somehow Onesimus and Paul's paths, they crossed. The Bible doesn't tell us the situation, but all we know is that Paul taught Onesimus the gospel. And Onesimus came to Jesus. Onesimus obeyed the gospel of Christ. And when Paul realized what had happened between Onesimus and Philemon, he penned this letter encouraging reconciliation and forgiveness between the two men. We need to be honest. Relationships among Christians are not perfect. Paul knows this firsthand. He had a friend that he evangelized with, someone who had vouched for him, when everybody else doubted him, a man by the name of Barnabas. And they had good work together, but then they had a disagreement. You have a man whose nickname is Encourager, and you have another man who has been separated to be the apostle to the Gentiles, and they had a disagreement. A relationship was there that was severed over a disagreement. But we see that reconciliation was being made because the disagreement was over a man by the name of John Mark. And now, all of a sudden, Paul is reaching out to John Mark, saying, I can use him. I need him. I'm in this prison. I need someone like John Mark in my life. Relationships among Christians are not perfect. But I stand here to, this morning to let you know that if we treat and talk 
to one another with dignity like Paul did with both Philemon, the one who was offended, and Onesimus, the one who was the offender, then love will have its perfect work. It will not fail. So where do you stand? Where do you stand on this morning? The same pleas that were made 2,000 years ago are the same pleas that are being made today. Present your body as a living sacrifice. If you haven't done it, I beg you to do so this day. Labor together in prayer. If you have not done that, I beg you this morning to start doing that from this day forward. Eyeball those that cause division. If there are people causing trouble, point them out and straighten them out. Because if you don't, then what Ezekiel, God said to Ezekiel in Ezekiel chapter 3, their blood will be on your hands. And the blood of those they led away will be on your hands. So keep your eyes open to those that are trying to undo what Jesus died for. Accept no division and dignify one another. If we have failed in these regards, I implore you, I beseech you, I beg you this day to get right with God. And if you're not a Christian, you need to become one. I beg you this day. See, I'm begging you now to come to Jesus. Because if Jesus comes and you're not right with him, there's no amount of begging you can do in that day that's going to change your status. That's going to change your destination. So I beg you, the person that brought you beg you, the person that invited you beg you, those that are here this morning are begging you, do not leave this place without first giving your life to Jesus Christ. You've heard the word. You know Jesus wants you saved. You know God wants you saved. So why don't you be saved? this day. We're about to sing a song. We're marching to Zion. You're not marching to Zion. You're running to hell until such a time that you give your life to Jesus. Do that about faith. That's called repentance and start marching with the rest of us to Zion. That beautiful city of God. Will you confess him this morning? Will you be baptized this morning? Have your sins washed away? Will you become a member of his body, his house? his church this day. Come to Jesus. Be reconciled to God while you still have time, while you still have this moment. There's only one date on God's calendar and that date is now. Forget that it's May 23rd. The date is now. Now is the accepted time. Now is the day of salvation. Now is the moment that you come to King Jesus. While together we stand and sing the song that has been selected.